This is my Bible. It is the Word of God and the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am. I'm seated right now in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. And I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert. My spirit is receptive. As I am taught the Word of God, my life has changed for the better. And I will never be the same again. Amen. May be seated. Over the course of the past month, I ministered on the Holy Spirit, and I know we've had some interesting weeks lately, and so if you missed any of those messages, I would encourage you to watch them or listen to them. And today, we're going to go back briefly to our previous series on the truth about money. While my father was preparing and studying for the Holy Week revival and the week of increase later in the year, the Lord put it on his heart to deal with the importance of vows and making our word come to pass. The importance of vows and the importance of making our word come to pass. And really, in a message like this, we're dealing with what we would call old-fashioned character traits. Integrity, faithfulness, and being men and women of our word. And that's who we ought to be as the children of God. That's who we ought to be as followers of Christ. Now, this is a powerful truth from God's word. And we don't often teach on it because ministers have abused it. But that does not change the fact that this truth has great power. And that's what Satan does. He deceives. And when something is powerful and effective, you know, a few weeks ago in learning about the Holy Spirit, I dealt with praying in the Spirit and praying in tongues. And one of the reasons why Satan works through religious people so strongly against that is because it has great power. So Satan is a liar, and he's a deceiver. And just because this is a truth that has been abused, it doesn't change the fact that this truth has great power when we work it properly in our everyday lives. Now in this series, The Truth About Money, we had two launching scriptures. The first was Matthew 6, 21. Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then verse 33, after dealing with worry, he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things. What things? The things that people in the world spend their entire lives chasing after, running after, trying to acquire through any means, unethical means, without character. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And so we learned in that series that if a man or woman, they're not right with their money, that reveals a heart problem. We learned that if you don't have a man or woman's money, you don't have their heart. We, re we learn that how we handle money and how we handle finances, it reveals our heart and our priorities. And we learn that the purpose of our prosperity is so we can be a blessing. So today we're going to deal with the incredible power of vows and making our word come to pass. The most famous vow in the Bible is in Genesis 28. And we dealt with that earlier in this series. It was last February having deceived his brother and his father, and having stolen his brother's inheritance, and having run away from home in disgrace, Jacob made the life-changing decision to embrace the faith pattern of his father and grandfather. And Jacob, in running from home and realizing that his life was a wreck, things were at rock bottom, and embracing the faith pattern of his father and grandfather, Jacob vowed to give God a tenth of everything that crossed his hands. And no doubt he learned that from his father and from his grandfather. Genesis 28, beginning in verse 20, then Jacob made a vow, a, a solemn pledge, a solemn promise, a solemn oath. He made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. 
and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. So that was the vow he made. That was the promise he made. Lord, if you'll do these things for me, of all that you give me, of all that crosses my hands, of all that you bless me with, I will give you a tenth. So Jacob obeyed the tithing principle at least 270 years before the law was given through Moses. He vowed a vow. And he didn't have any preacher preaching to him. He didn't have any pastor teaching him. He learned that from his family. He learned that from his father and from his grandfather. And he embraced his family's faith pattern. He made a vow to tithe when he had nothing, just a stick. He, he was fleeing. He wasn't just leaving. He, he was fleeing from home, afraid for his life because of how he had conducted himself. Lies, deceit, tre treachery, theft, being a liar, being a deceiver. The Bible says a supplanter. He had nothing but a stick, but he vowed to God. The most powerful vow you'll ever make is when you have nothing or very little. And you don't have to have anything to start obeying God. You don't have to have anything to start living your life by the Word of God or being a doer of the Word of God. You don't have to have anything to do what Jacob did and start tithing. In fact, it's easier to start when you have very little. Sometimes the people that have great difficulty, they've acquired much, they've accumulated much, and it can be difficult for them to obey God and to surrender their lives to God. That's why Jesus dealt with the rich young ruler the way he did in the Gospels, that it, it can be hard for the rich man to pass through the eye of the needle because he has achieved great success on his own without the help of God. And so it's easier to obey God. It's easier to begin living your life in line with the word of God when you're getting started, when you're young, or when you have very little. But the truth is this, if we won't obey God with what we have now, then he knows we won't obey him if we have more. If we won't obey him and do what's right with what we have now, he knows we won't obey him with more. So you don't need any money to start tithing. All you need is commitment. All you need is a desire to give and be a blessing. All it takes to start tithing is, in fact, love. Love for God's work, love for God's mission, and love for God's house. And it has more to do with love than money or finances. Two Sundays ago in the message on the motive of love, we learned that everything goes back to love. And love should be the motive for everything. For, for faith, for prayer, for the exercising of spiritual gifts, for money, and for finances. As a father, as a parent, why do I do the things that I do for Jessica, for the, the children? Because I love them. Why, why do I do things like braces or all the appointments? Because I love them, and I want them to be well taken care of. So tell your neighbor, smile, and say, it has to do with love. Tell your other neighbor, say, it has to do with love. Now, on March 22nd of last year, in a message entitled, Activating the Power of God, we dealt with another famous vow in the Old Testament, and that is Hannah's vow. Hannah, if you'll remember, Hannah was barren, and she made a vow, a promise, a solemn oath or pledge to God that if God would open her womb and give her a son, then she would give her firstborn to the Lord. And her firstborn was Samuel, who turned out to be one of the greatest men of God, one of the greatest prophets of God in the history of Israel. And she kept her word. She made her word come to pass. She was barren. She had no children. And in desperation, she made a vow. And God did his part, but then Hannah had to do her part. And she kept her word. She, she made her word come to pass. And then later, God blessed her with three more sons and two daughters. What a wonderful harvest, amen? She gave a child to the kingdom of God, and God blessed her with five more. The word vow, as an example, the word vow is in the New International Version of the Bible more than 80 times. And the day will just hit a few of the highlights. The context of the word vow more often has to do with free will offerings given above and beyond the time. Sometimes vows were made by a group, as in Numbers 21 and verse 2. Then Israel made this vow to the Lord. If you will deliver these people into our hands, we will totally destroy their cities. Number one, vows to God must be fulfilled. 
So we see this in the Word of God, and we can make a vow. We can make a promise. We can make a solemn commitment. But we see, number one, that vows to God must be fulfilled. We, as the people of God, as the children of God, as followers of Jesus Christ in this dark world, we ought to be people of our word. We ought to be men and women of our word. And we ought to make our word come to pass. Now at FCC, we don't often use the word vow. And again, it's because ministers, sadly, they abuse it. We also don't use the word pledge. You know, that, that can be a very denominational word. We don't do pledges. We don't do fundraiser drives, amen. We don't bring outside consultants in. We simply always tell you, the people, to give, to do whatever the Lord puts on your heart. And that has great power, amen. We use the word commitment. But whatever word you use, vows to God must be fulfilled. Numbers 30 and verse 2 says, when a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything. How much? Everything he said. And this is so important because of the culture that we live in today. In the past, you know, decades ago, people would say things like, a man's word is his bond. Or something like, a man's only as good as his word. But sadly, that's not the culture that we live in today. People lie. People deceive. People don't make their word come to pass. And it can be very challenging in uh, the culture we live in today. That's why you've got to confess every day that you're blessed, you're protected, your steps are ordered of the Lord, amen, that anybody that you need for anything done, and you know, we realize that after the weather we had that there are some families that need some things fixed, taken care of, replaced, whatever it is. But even in that, confess that God is bringing the right people to you. God is bringing the right people to your home and your property, that the people that come will do their work with excellence. They'll charge the price they should charge. They, they won't gouge. They won't take advantage of the situation. They won't make it worse, amen. And part of the reason why we confess those things is it's the lousy culture that we live in today. And in this culture that we live in today, people don't make their word come to pass. Now, if you'll have ears to hear, as Jesus said, and be a doer of the word of God, this message will save you a lot of heartache and a lot of trouble, most of which we inflict upon ourselves. When you tell God that you're going to do something, do it. You know, Nike used to advertise, just do it. When you tell God that you're going to do something, doesn't matter what it is, something regarding your family, something regarding your children, something regarding living right, something regarding a gift, Whatever it is, when you tell God that you're going to do something, do it. Despite what the culture says, our Heavenly Father is not like our teacher at school. He's not like one of our casual friends or a Facebook friend. He's not, as the young people say, our BFF. He's not our guidance counselor. He is a great king. He is the Almighty God. He is the creator, the master of the universe. And we shouldn't play games with God. We shouldn't play around with the things of God. Hebrews 10, verse 31, which is in the New Testament, says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So don't play games with God. Numbers 30 and verse 2, when a man or a woman makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do how much? Everything. So it doesn't matter what the culture's doing. It doesn't matter what the culture out there says is acceptable in 2021. For, for us as the children of God, for us as followers of Christ, there has to be a higher standard. And that standard is the Word of God. And so we ought to be people of our Word. We ought to make our Word come to pass. The Bible says, even though it hurts, we ought to be people of our Word. We ought to make our Word come to pass. So Jacob fulfilled his vow. You can read about his story, how God, how God blessed him, and how when he came back home, he was so blessed that they had various groups, and he spread it all out so his, his older brother wouldn't realize how blessed he was. Hannah made her word come to pass, and God blessed her. So vows to God must be fulfilled. Number two, you're not required to make a vow. It's not a requirement. Tell your neighbor, say, it's not a requirement. 
And this is why the Bible says it's better not to vow than to vow. You're not required to make a vow. It is your decision. But if you make a vow, fulfill it. If you make a vow, bring your word to pass. Deuteronomy 23 and verse 21. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not be slow to pay it. For the Lord your God will certainly demand it of you and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from making a vow, you will not be guilty. Whatever your lips utter, you must be sure to do because you made your vow freely. That, that means it's your choice. It's your decision. It's of your own free will because you made your vow freely to the Lord your God with your own mouth. So you opened your mouth, you spoke, you made the promise, you made the commitment. You did it freely of your own free will. So you're not required to make a vow, but it, it's your decision. But if you make a vow, fulfill it. You're not required to make a vow or a commitment, but if you do make one, it's your decision. If you do make one, make sure and fulfill it. Number three, don't make foolish or hasty vows. You might not mean it, but God will hold you to it. Number three, don't make foolish or hasty vows. You may not mean it, but God will hold you to it. Proverbs 20 and verse 25 says, it is a trap. Say, it's a trap, which means it is a danger to be avoided. It is a trap for a man to dedicate something rashly. What does that mean? Without thinking it through, without praying about it, without considering it first. If you're married, without you and your, hus with, without you and your wife or you and your husband, considering it together, praying about it together, seeking the will of the Lord together. It is a trap for a man to dedicate something rashly and only later to consider his vows. This is one reason, and I dealt with this in the last month, this is one reason why we're, we're so careful about who we allow in to minister, not just in here, but even, even to the young people. You know, there was once I was upstairs for a youth service, and a young man came, and you know, he's, he's a friend of mine. I love him. God, God bless him. But God will deal with men and women called to full-time ministry in ways that are different than he might deal with your average person or your, your average situation. There was a situation once where there was a guy and he was wanting to lay hands on everybody saying all the youth were called into full-time ministry. That is what Jesus said. It's putting burdens on people's backs they cannot carry. It is a serious thing. And so, yes, there might be a young person that God has called to be a pastor or to be a, a missionary. And if God has called them to it, God will give them the grace for it. But see, if a minister in his presentation leads a bunch of young people who are not called to think they're called, that they will struggle with the guilt and the condemnation of that for the rest of their life. And so that's why before you tell the Lord you're going to do this, or you're going to do that, or you're going to go, you're going to go live in a hut in Africa, there might still be a few places where they still have huts, amen, that you better think about it first. You better pray about it first. Because it is a serious thing to make a promise, a vow, a commitment to God, and then to only later consider it. Ecclesiastes 5, beginning in verse 4. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. So verse 5 is key. It is better to not vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth... And again, what's one of the major things in our lives that trips us up? James calls the mouth, the tongue, a, a world of evil set on fire by hell itself. I said, I think two Wednesday nights ago, that our mouth, our tongue can either be set on fire by hell or it can be set on fire by the Holy Spirit. Well, I would rather have a tongue anointed by the Holy Spirit, amen? To be used for good things in the kingdom of God. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. And do not protest to the temple messenger saying, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? So don't make foolish or hasty. That means rash, quick, without having thought about it, without having prayed about it. Do not make foolish or hasty vows to God. You might not mean it, but he'll hold you to it. In Judges 11, you can read the story of Jephthah, one of the judges. You can read the story in Judges 11 of Jephthah and his foolish, foolish, foolish vow. It was rash, 
He didn't consider it. He certainly didn't pray about it. It's a sad tale and one of the greatest tragedies in the Word of God. So don't make foolish or rash or hasty vows. You've heard my father share the story of how as a little boy, he watched my grandmother be tormented because she vowed to God that she would give up smoking. She'd give up cigarettes and how she struggled with that and was tormented by it. And we believe in the help of God, amen? We believe in the help of the, the Holy Spirit. But when you make a vow, you gotta do your part to make your word come to pass. And it's not always an easy thing. And that's why we should be men and women who keep our word and we make our word come to pass even if it hurts, amen? Number four, don't make a vow to God and then later try to give less than what you vowed. Don't make a vow or a promise to the Lord and then later try to give less than what you vowed. Look at Malachi chapter one and verse 14. Cursed is the cheat. So what does God call the person? The cheat, who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. Of course, theirs was an agri agrarian society. And so they would give offerings that were heart from the harvest or they would give of their livestock. You've heard me give the example that if someone has a cow, it's a, it's a certain value here in Texas, but if it's a cow that somebody has backed into in their Ford Super Duty, it does not have the same value anymore. And so what they were doing in Malachi's day is they were going through the motions of obedience. They were going through the motions of their giving and bringing their sacrificial offerings, but they were, they were bringing blemished animals. They were bringing blemished sacrifices. Maybe a dove with an eye missing. Maybe an animal that had been injured. Or they were to bring and give what was first. So they were bringing and giving things that were not first or they were not the best. And God called them cheats. Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord, and my name is to be feared among the nations. So don't make a vow or a promise or a commitment to God and then later try to give him less than what you said. When we give less than our best, when we fail to make our word come to pass, when we bring to God what he says is unacceptable, then we open the door to the curse. And that's really the problem of the culture we live in today. There are, there are things in the word of God that God says are unacceptable in, in our lives and how we live, but also even in our finances. And we, we live in a world that calls every evil and wicked, despicable thing, this world calls it acceptable. But just because something is acceptable in the world doesn't mean it's acceptable to God. Just because the world is okay with something doesn't mean God is okay with it. And so when we head down the road of doing things in any area of your life that are unacceptable to God, you open the door to the curse. And we know in Galatians, Paul tells us as Christians under the new covenant, we're redeemed from the curse. But when you disobey, when you do your own thing, when you do open the door in your life to things that God says are unacceptable, then you open the door to the curse. So don't cheat God and don't cheat yourself out of the blessings that belong to you as a child of God. Number five, King David had the most to say about vows in the Bible. He had the most to say. An example is Psalm 50 and verse 14. Sacrifice, thank offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. So he wrote, fulfill your vows to the Most High. Psalm 76, 11, make vows to the Lord your God and fulfill them. Let all the neighboring lands bring gifts to the one to be feared. So make vows to God and fulfill them. Or Psalm 116, 14, I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. And again, we need to be men and women of our word. When someone is married, when a couple is married, they often make their vows in public before people because it is a solemn commitment. Or here, I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. This is why pastors make their challenge offerings public. This is why Jessica and I, along with many others, we made public commitments on Easter Sunday, 2018. 
We are fulfilling our vows to the Lord and the presence of all his people. As men and women of our word, making our word come to pass. You might say, Austin, in this part of my life, I've messed up. In this part of my life, I failed to make my word come to pass. Well, praise God, he forgives us, amen? Praise God, his mercies are new every morning. But you ought not keep doing the same thing again and again and again. Well, we ought to change. We ought to do better. We ought to improve for the better. And from this day forward, we ought to be men and women of our word. Something we're mindful of that my father would often use as an example when we were growing up is he would say that as parents, we ought to keep our word to our children. And so if we tell our children, we're going to do this or we're going to go there, you know, he, he'd give the example of Six Flags. I'm not promising my children we're going to Six Flags. And, and Jessica, with all this craziness in the culture, she doesn't want to go anywhere, amen? She just wants to go here in Florida, I guess. So he would give the example that if you tell your children, we're going to do this, we're going to go there, we're going to go do this fun thing, and something comes up. Because in life, things come up. And if you're unable to make your word, he would say, ask your children's forgiveness, tell them you'll make it up to them, and then make your word come to pass, make it up to them. Amen? And so the point is, in our families, in our home, we ought to be men and women of our word. With your husband or wife, you ought to be a man or woman of your word. With your children, you ought to be a man or woman of your word. You ought to model for your children and your family that we are people who make our word come to pass. At work, doesn't matter what's going on in the culture. At work, you ought to be someone who makes your word come to pass. And I'm telling you, if out there in this wicked world, if you are a man or woman who makes your word come to pass, if you do everything you do with excellence and with integrity, you will rise higher and higher and higher because there will be people who search you out to do business with you. God did such a wonderful miracle on Friday. One of the, Jessica and I, praise God, we don't have to get anything taken care of inside the house, but outside we've got to get some things replaced and taken care of. And of course, everybody uses COVID as their excuse. Well, there are shortages, there are part shortages, this is impossible, and months and months and months. But a man came to our house Friday, and I'm just so amazed by this. And he he stood there and he said, Austin, we are going to make our word come to pass. And I told my boss that I told Mr. Lingerfeld that we're going to get you fixed. We're going to get it done here in the next few weeks. We're going to have the parts for you. And so he said, we've set aside everything you need. It has your name on it. He said, even if I have to take it home to my house to make sure no one else uses that for any other jobs, you have the parts, they have your name on it. We're going to make our word come to pass. Now, that, that is a miracle in 2021. And just think how that, that made me feel, as full of faith as I am. So let that be an encouragement to you in this dark world and culture, if in your work, if in what you do for a living, if you'll be a man or woman of your word, you will never lack for business. You will never lack for people searching you out. Amen? So be a man or woman of your word. Make your word come to pass. With your family, with your children, with the Lord, and everything you do. Number six, vows can be made in times of trouble, but be careful to fulfill your vows to the Lord, or times of trouble will never leave you. Job 22 and verse 27 says, you will pray to him and he'll hear you, and you will fulfill your vows. So we know the story of Job. He was in trouble, but at the end, he ended up with twice as much. Here's another example, Jonah 2 and verse 9. But I, with the song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. So in trouble, Jonah made a vow. God had his attention because of how God dealt with him. And I don't ever want to end up in a situation like that, amen? But Jonah made a vow. He told the Lord, what I have vowed, I will make good. So vows can be made in times of trouble or distress. But be careful to fulfill your vows to the Lord or times of trouble will never leave you. And in the New Testament, point number seven, the Apostle Paul and others also made vows. We see that in the book of Acts, in Acts 18.18 18, and Acts 21.23. So making a vow, making a promise, making a commitment, it has great power, but the power is in making your word come to pass. And that's what God can honor. That's what God can bless. You've heard us refer to Fred Price a lot recently because he's gone to be with the Lord. 
Dr. Fred Price would often say, a man is no better than his word. He would also say, a man is what he does. I was so grieved at one point last year because I saw one of the young men I know. He's not a friend, he's an acquaintance. But, but he was actually teaching, you're not what you do. See, that, that's not Bible. That's the, that's the wicked culture we're living in today. We are what we do. We are the things that we do. What we do, the fruit of our lives, it indicates the tree that we really are. And so you need to realize that whatever you do is who you are. And you need to be a man or woman of your word. You need to make your word come to pass. Once you understand the power of this, the power of vows, the power of making a, a holy and solemn commitment to God, and the incredible power of making your word come to pass, once you understand it, your life will change for the better. There is great power in making a vow to God and fulfilling it. There is great power in making a, a solemn and holy commitment to God and fulfilling your word. There is great power in being a man or woman of your word. When you live a life of integrity, when you're a man or woman of your word, when you make your word come to pass, one benefit is you'll have an easier time believing that God will also make his word come to pass in your life. And this is so important. See, parents in the homes, we, we, we are a model of Father God. And so how we treat our children and how we conduct ourselves, it does matter. And we don't want them to grow up thinking that we're, we're liars, we're hypocrites. And that's one problem that many young people face as they get older is that they hear the word of God on Sunday, but they see a different reality Monday through Saturday. And so we need to model who our great heavenly father is. He is a man of his word and he makes his word, the living word, come to pass. And if in your life you'll make your word come to pass, it'll be easier for you to believe God that he will make his word come to pass. You'll have greater confidence when you pray. You'll have greater confidence when you confess and say what the word says. You'll be able to have faith and pray with confidence without your heart condemning you. Not everyone reaches this level of faith. Integrity, truthfulness, faithfulness, and commitment. But friends, this has great power. And this is the place. This is the level where men and women of faith rule and reign in this life.